Okay, so thank you, Stephanie. Good uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Fiona Preston White, and with my colleague Dr. Adil Bakir, we'll be presenting from the from CFAS, which is the Centre of Environment, Fisheries, and Aquaculture Science in the United Kingdom. And we'll be talking with you to you about um, data and its role in supporting institutional and individual behaviour changes regarding marine litter. Now, marine litter and plastic specifically is very interesting, as it's one of the few ecological problems where change has been driven by human response and individual observations, rather than the solid long-term data sets that have driven policy change when it's come to issues such as climate change and the whole in the ozone layer. So observations such as what you can see in the background picture, which is um, taken in Durban off those floods earlier this year. Now, with marine litter, there is this huge public awareness, which is causing policymakers to make very quick decisions where there are still existing data gaps, um, specifically more on regional and country level. So some of these specific issues um, I'll be talking about is I'll be talking to you regarding your macro and meso litter, and then Adil will pick up um, the microplastic side of it. And obviously one of our data gaps from the microplastic side comes in with ecotoxicity, so sort of chemicals that are carried within plastics and what this means for human and animal health. Um, and then also we have some poor data on alternative materials which are being developed and proposed as alternatives for a lot of plastics and poor data when it comes to life cycle assessments of these and also a little expand on this. Um, and then we have poor data when it comes to successful solutions working on a larger scale. So we are working on trying to close some of these data gaps with some comparative studies in a program that we're working on called the Commonwealth Litter Program, which is occurring around the world um, in Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Belize, and South Africa is part of this program. And what this essentially allows is for some comparative studies and bringing together macro litter studies, micro litter studies, waste classification studies, and sharing of best practices that have worked regionally and globally, and allowing for an integrated understanding um, which can be used to either guide policy change or guide individual behavior or industrial change based on solid data. So in tackling an issue such as marine litter, data is key in understanding any of the crucial sources that you have and monitoring the effectiveness of policy intervention. Now, South Africa, the United Kingdom and Japan all have very long running data sets specifically on marine litter. Uh, whether it be from uh, beach litter data or from seafloor trawl data. And globally, there is some very nice data sets which identify top 10 items. And your Ocean Conservancy International Coastal Cleanup data is one of these data sets that utilize um, citizen science and has identified the top 10 items found on the beaches globally. Now, for comparison and logistical reasons, beaches are a really good spot for monitoring um, macro litter specifically when it comes to marine litter and comparing your more global results with your country specific results becomes very interesting and for this I just want to identify first the cigarettes the top items specifically link it in with the great British clean cleanup data which um, cigarette items then on number two and what I really want to highlight here with you is one the drop of that item as we go down. So this is in Vanuatu, looking at some of the data, your cigarette butts drop still in the top 10, but drops in number. And once again, Solomon Islands, not as high as within the UK as a number within one of your top items for marine litter. And very interestingly, when you get into Belize now, please note that the, the data for this particular, for Belize is still undergoing collection of that. So this is not final data or anything, but I thought it'd be quite interesting to share with you. Specifically, as your cigarette butts go drop below your top 10 items and into your top 20 items. And the reason for this is behavior change. Your community and your, your country, Belize as a country, don't really smoke cigarettes. Where in comparison, the UK clearly does and contributes significantly to the contribution of cigarette butts, specifically within our oceans. And this is where you start looking at different policies and your data becomes more fascinating. A couple of years ago, England introduced a do not smoke in pubs policy law. And in the year and years that followed that, there was a spike in the number of cigarette stubs that were picked up across British beaches. 
And the reason for this was everyone who previously smoked in pubs where there were ashtrays now smoked outside and tended to drop their cigarette stubs and therefore it entered into the environment. Now, what this really highlights is therefore a need to capture behavior change within specifically Britain for this particular case to tackle basically a policy that led to increased marine litter. And there's been some really interesting innovative solutions to this that have driven policy and uh, not policy behavior change. So for example, what you now see is as you're leading up to major sporting events, specifically your, um, your soccer games, you'll get the equivalent of giant ashtrays, but um, they're voting booths essentially. And once you finish smoking your cigarette, you, you put your stump in whichever team you support. And long term, that does two things. One, it makes sure that the cigarette butts don't go onto the, the streets. They get you know, put specifically in ashtray to be removed. And two, for the people involved, it shows, well, depending how you look at it, either whose team has more supporters or whose team smokes more, depending how you want to interpret that. But from a behavior change point of view, it has been quite instrumental as a way of encouraging people to change their behavior without having to go through long term awareness raising techniques. Now, one of the interesting things when you start looking at your marine litter, and one of the things that countries, governments, people turn around and say a lot of the time is transboundary. It's not coming from us, it's coming from somewhere else. And this, as I'm sure you're all aware, is something that is very difficult to actually put down how much is transboundary and how much is coming from a country itself. So there's a couple of different ways that you can certainly show a country that they are actually producing some of the litter that is ending up in the beaches, because it's not always as obvious as it was after the kwazulu Natal rains this year. Um, a lot of the time it's much more subtle. So what you start looking at is your sweet and crisp packet, for example. So you have a look at what you're seeing and you have a look, because obviously this is a summary bit of data, but all of this, you've actually collected a lot more data behind this data. And you can have a look at what logos are coming up, what type of brands, you go to the shops, you see what's sold in the country and what's not sold in the country. And then you can start seeing that if what's sold in the country is ending up in beaches. So that's, that's a start, but then you can take it a step further and you start seeing items such as your ice lolly plastic container, which I've highlighted as number 10 item within Solomon Islands. Now, this is, this is an item you get in South Africa. It's an item you get in Solomon Islands. It's an item you do not get in the United Kingdom at all. So if this turned up in the United Kingdom on the beaches, it would either be because someone had brought it in in their suitcase, which is unlikely because the weather's quite bad here. And um, this is specifically for ice lolly um, plastic containers. And so if, if it comes up on the beaches, your chance are, starts being transboundary. But then you can take it that step further. Belize gives a really fascinating example. And if you look at number eight on the Belize list, you're looking at drinking plastic pouches. Now, what are these? Your drinking plastic pouches are essentially these packets of plastic with that either have milk or juice or water in them, and people drink straight out of them. So you bite the corner off and you drink it, and it's essentially like a flimsy water bottle. Very, very disposable. Now, this is a problem item that is on the top 10 list within find, found within the Belize environment. So it's a very specific Belize issue, but more than that is a very specific Belizean product. All of these products are made in Belize, sold in Belize, and very seldom found anywhere else in the world. So it's a very good example to prove straight away that certainly some of the, the marine litter being found within the country's environment comes from the country itself. And it's also a really nice and easy one to tackle because we then had a look at it in comparison with uh, waste classification data, and I'll speak of complementary data later on in my talk. But within the waste classification data for households, none of these pouches were turning up, which means people are only drinking this outside of the home. So they're utilizing it as a disposable water bottle, which it is, but it's not being used in the home. So what you're dealing with straight away is a behavior change or an industrial change issue. So you either got to lead to people not littering, so a whole behavioral movement around that, or encouraging the use of reusable uh, water bottles, or you've got to tackle the industry that's producing them in the first place. And that's where your more policy side comes in um, on which approach the government particularly wants to take, or an industry volunteers to take. Um, for example, your alternative that could be used there is making the, the plastic out of those seaweed pouches the way the seaweeds are edible. Now, I'm not using it saying alternative plastics, it's all going to 
why I'm not saying that, but if you start then looking at an edible container um, or a reusable container. So just an example, and while we're on the Belize one, I just want to highlight bottle caps. Bottle caps are right on the list of um, Belize top 10, and that's metal bottle caps, so coming with glass containers specifically. And that's really interesting because what it shows within Belize specifically is you've got a very successful and unsuccessful scheme going on at the same time. And the successful scheme is the return of your glass drinking bottles because all their, their coke and Sprite and all that comes in glass, or a lot of it. And there's a deposit return scheme there, which works really well, but it doesn't include the metal bottle caps. So everywhere you go and on all your beaches and your rivers, everywhere in your parks, you have these metal bottle caps. So you've immediately got an easy way of solving that. You're either looking at increase, increasing your incentive for return of your bottles with an additional um, an additional incentive if the metal cap comes back with it, and at the same time supporting the metal recycling industry. Because this is a contrast between Belize and I'm going to use South Africa in this example, because South Africa's actually got a very good recycling metal industry. And, you know, that comes from the history of having mining in the country and all of that, and so being a source for where metal can come from for the rest of the world. Um, but it, it's still a way of showing that then a little bit of support for the recycling industry can remove this form of litter quite easily and remove it out of your top 10 items. So how do you utilize that data and start looking at what changes need to happen in order to reduce your marine litter, or in this case, um, I've used beach litter on the slide. So I spoke briefly on um, um, one of the techniques being used um, within the UK for cigarette butts, but I'd like to highlight that that's not really a government policy, that is individual areas and in implementing that sort of, sort of one. So if you look at more from a government point of view, and a policy point of view, even industry point of view, looking at improving um, your behavior change campaigns around stopping people actually littering with cigarettes, is you'll find a lot of people who don't consider themselves litter bugs do actually throw their cigarettes on the ground. And then if you start looking at your, your glass fragments, which will come from obviously bottles that haven't been recycled, your metal, your plastic bottle bottles that you find on the beaches, and, and that all show a break, breakdown of what is a highly valuable waste and resource that should be being recycled. And, and what you need to look at then is improving your collection systems and your container deposit return schemes come in place here if you're looking from policy point of view. Um, if you're looking in specifically with South Africa, your informal industry in South Africa is very, very well um, set up in making sure that a lot of these high value products return back into the economy. Um, you don't always have that in, in other parts, parts of the world, and there are certain areas where it can improve further and should be improved further. Then I've mentioned to you the plastic um, drink pouches specifically in Belize. That's what they look at, like in the left-hand side of your screen. You can see it. Um, and just mentioning in there, linking what I said earlier about behavior change or you know slightly alternatives can be used. Um, metal bottle caps, I've also mentioned that to you about bringing in your incentives. And then looking at your ice lolly sticks and your lolly pop sticks. And then on the, the right, that's the frozen ice lolly um, containers that I spoke to you about. I mentioned we're specifically in Solomon Islands or are an issue specifically in Solomon Islands for their top 10 list. And certainly for things where you start looking at your, your, um, your lolly sticks or your psycho sticks, um, depending where, where in the world you, you, you are, the, the name changes a little bit. So. There's a couple of different approaches that you can look at behavior change in the individual level in where people don't buy the items. You know, they buy other forms of sweets, not suckers, because, you know, there's less plastic involved. Um, you look at industrial changes where there are already a lot of your, well, not a lot of, but certain um, sweets, suckers come with um, your, your paper a stick, not your plastic stick. You get your wooden sticks that come in with your um, ice creams, things like that. So, that sort of change on your more industrial side. And then you can have the step further. You can have industry actually look at it, all government look at it and say, why is there a plastic stick stuck into a sweet? Why do we need that? Why don't we reduce that and remove that issue altogether? Because then you're not dealing with a marine litter item anymore because it doesn't exist as a marine litter item because it's not being sold. And it's not using another resource either. So you're not looking at paper, so coming from trees, wood coming from trees or plastic coming from oil. So you reduce, you're looking at overall reduction. So it's a slight also change in that mindset, not just looking at overall reduction, depending what the issue is. And then taking it to the next step, looking at the items like your plastic cutlery and straws and things like that come up as one of your, your top items. Now, 
On the behavior change, you're seeing a lot of people already doing this where they're refusing to accept these sort of items or they're bringing their own, like your reusable straws or cutleries. And then you get the governments that are stepping in with policy and being like, right, these have to be banned. And the moment they bring it in, it has to be banned, you start having people bring in the alternatives rather than just looking at the reduction. And once again, if it's alternative plastics, I will touch on that very briefly. Um, and then when you start looking at your items turning up, such as all small plastics and all small polystyrene pieces and fragments, well, you've got a couple of different options in your source here. You either have your options where it's coming in because it's, it's been a bigger item, it's broken down over time in the marine environment, it's been there for so long, or the general environment, or you're looking at the disposal has been through things like burning. And that has led to fragments then escaping into um, the environment. And obviously, if you're burning waste on a non industrial scale, you have other issues such as release of toxins, the temperatures aren't high enough, and your human health problems that go with that. So, you've got a combined issue coming in at, at play there. And very much it's policy that starts having an impact there because um, governments do a lot of awareness, rain, um, awareness around open burning when it comes to cooking or waste management, and that depending which country you're in. So it's looking at targeting and from that point of view an awareness around that particular issue. And then obviously for the bigger items that have broken down over time and become your, your meso-sized plastics and then eventually the microplastics, which Adil will be talking to you about, what you really need is regional cooperation and collaboration to tackle the very source of the marine litter problem together. And that's that's going to take us all working together. And I mean, that's one of the reasons we're all part of um, the series now is, is an attempt towards, towards working towards that. And then very, very briefly, linking in polystyrene. Now, the reason I actually wanted to bring in polystyrene is one, it turns up in just about every beach that we've done surveys on, um, on smaller or bigger scales. And um, the background picture is from a beach in Vanuatu, looking at the undergrowth side. And the picture to the far right is a box that's actually longer than a meter. It's so about a meter and a half lo long, and it's got all the polystyrene collected on that particular beach during that survey. And what it's highlighting is something that actually happened a couple of years ago during Cyclone Pan. We had a lot of polystyrene escape from a, um, a, a factory and were never collected as part of the cleanup efforts. And what this means is a long term issue in that particular area. And that's why your overall improved correct disposal, if you haven't managed to reduce, and reduce is obviously your first aim, becomes really, really important after disasters. And it, it covers all marine litter. Your, after cleanup becomes really, really key. And it's not just for your bigger items, but your smaller items such as this as well. And then you get some really easy items that you can tackle straight away as long as you know they're a problem. And the one I really want to highlight is the one on the right here, which is a beer label, a plastic beer label that fits in a glass bottle off a brand in Vanuatu. It's one of the few beer labels in the world that I'm aware of that's plastic and not paper. And the, this particular beer label, the, it is actually a deposit return scheme for these beers, and the glass gets returned a lot of the time when possible. They, they, they do have issues around it, and it's needing a little bit of support. But we're still getting a lot of the plastic labels ending up in the environment. And a simple change to either changing that to um, a, a paper label or changing that to even an, an inscription written on the glass bottle rather, you know, because these bottles get reused all the time. So if you change the label to something that's ingrained in the bottle, that's another alternative. It's a very, very simple way that you can just tackle one item that immediately brings down your marine litter. And then you get simple things that become very country specific. This is Vanuatu. Um, every beach we went onto, snorkel and goggles came up. And this is a tourism issue. This is your straight tourists. And therefore, you need your policies in place to help with awareness raising when it comes to your tourists coming into your country so they're not leading to littering through leaving things like their goggles and snorkels behind. And then I want to talk to you about the importance of complementary data because this is very important in marine litter because if we didn't have a problem within our waste management that was leading to leakage of waste into the environment, we wouldn't have as big a marine litter problem as we do. We would still have the issue, but it wouldn't be quite as big. So understanding what is happening within waste management becomes absolutely crucial. May understanding what it is made up of and understanding where you can help the waste management by reducing certain items so it's not under as much strain becomes important. And I want to pick up Vanuatu specifically here um, because they just have a really interesting data stream in that your top items, and this is a very brief summary of, of the findings, but your top items are nappies, food, and organic wastes. 
And a lot of the rest of the items that you have peat bottles are recyclable. And this is found in household waste. So straight away, what can you do? Well, your nappies, you can start introducing your home compostable nappies, your reusable nappies, and encourage people to use them. Or you can take it a step further, which Vanuatu has done, where um, the government is including nappies in their plastic legislation process, and that's a government choice. And then you can look at introducing municipal composting for your food and organic waste. And that certainly in Vanuatu removes, and I'll show you in a minute in Solomon's as well, removes a huge amount of waste from your overall um, waste management system. And then you can introduce and improve your recycling system on the re remaining ones. And by introducing schemes that stop the, introducing separation at source, that stop that contamination of your recyclables and allow the waste management system to deal with less waste is a way forward and obviously is something that they need support on the government side, the policy side, and an individual behavioral side, as well as business industry and um, overall institutional side. Um, I just want to very, very bring, briefly bring in that you can take this a step further and you can look at your household waste to see what sort of plastic bags are involved, for example, I'm using plastic bags, this is Vanuatu again, and plastic, certain type of plastic band is actually banned there, but you still, it's the blue one, but you're still getting some of it within your waste streams. But if you compare it straight away to your Solomon ones, which are here, you can see within Honingara, which is the center of Solomon, so your capital, um, you're looking at 3.7 bags per week of this type of bag specifically ending up within your, your uh, household waste. But if you compare it back to Port Vila, it's your capital of Vanuatu, it's only down to 1.7, showing that a comparison between the two countries, and it would be better to do one country's comparison at a time, but in this particular case, that it is that particular policy is working specifically, even though it was only a year in um, for that ban taking place. And then you can take your, your household data further and you can break it down and have a look at exactly what containers have different recyclable status. So you can look at how much support is needed for that different recycling, because obviously it's not, if it's in your household waste, it is not ending up in the correct waste streams. So it's about that further anal analyzing of the data. And then I just mentioned that Vanuatu and Solomon were quite similar in both having very, very high organics within the waste streams. But it's also about then understanding it further and understanding your difference between your urban areas versus your rural areas. And this slide gives a nice example that shows that within your urban areas so on the left hand side, um, there's a lot more other products within your household waste. And what governments have to be prepared for is as rural areas get greater buying power, you can expect your so your right hand side one, your rural one, to change closer to your more urban um, waste stream and what's occurring within the waste management. So it allows for forward planning on the parts of governments to put in place policies in place and support in place and um, awareness in place before you get to that step. Um, and then I would like to pass that on to Adil to pick up on the microplastics. And then once he's picked up on the microplastics, we'll stop the questions. Okay, so thank you very much, Fiona, for your kind introduction. And hi, everyone. And thank you so much for taking a bit of your time today uh, to discuss an important uh, matter. So the title we picked out for today is Monitoring of Macroplastics in Environmental Samples as Scientific Evidence for Policymaking. So a quick overview of the presentation. So first, macroplastics, what's all the fuss about? So why do we care so much about them? Uh, where do they all go? Uh, monitoring of macroplastic, why and where? Uh, can one method actually fit all? And should science guide policy or policy guide uh, science? So macroplastics, what's all the fuss about? So I'm sure you've all heard about macroplastics. And for those of you who never heard about them, they can be defined as particles below five millimeter in size. They can be defined as primary macroplastics, which are plastic materials manufactured as microplastics. And they can find their way to the marine environment through accidental spillages or from runoffs following rainfall events. Secondary macroplastics, on the other hand, are the materials resulting from the degradation of larger debris. Uh, we know that macroplastics can have detrimental effects in the marine environment. Uh, macroplastics can have physical impacts on marine organisms following ingestion, with the disruption of normal biological and physiological processes. Uh, we also know that macroplastics can have a chemical impact in a marine environment, with the absorption and concentration of harmful contaminants from the seawater. Our previous research has shown that the chemicals can be transferred from plastic to marine organisms following ingestion. 
However, some studies suggested that such transfer would be negligible compared to other sources, uh, especially from the uptake from contaminated surrounding water or from the ingestion of contaminated food. However, it is still unclear whether plastic additives can cause a chemical effect as they can be added at very high concentration in some cases. Macroplastics have also been found in drinking, drinking water and food for human consumption. And it is therefore uh, not surprising that they have also been found in our guts with unknown related effects. Okay, so the big question we are trying to answer, uh, can macroplastics cause harm? And I took harm here is used as a white term to take into consideration the environment, food safety and human health. So despite an explosion in research on macroplastics, a lot of knowledge gaps remain, uh, especially the lack of risk assessment for macroplastics in the freshwater and the marine environment is making the prioritization of research drivers difficult. Uh, as far as I know, there's only a couple of, uh, of papers, a publication actually addressing the risk assessment for macroplastics in the freshwater and marine environment. Uh, and one of, one of them actually is a paper from Everhart and Al from 2016. And shortcomings in data is necessary to address for risk assessments. Are they due to the lack of standardization and difficulties in comparison between studies? And laboratory simulations are often based on unrealistic environmental concentrations with lower particular sizes than the ones sampled and monitored in an aquatic environment. And this would be the topic two on plastic pollution. Are we looking at the right size? If you wanted to discuss this topic into more details. And because of these gaps, we have actually uh, uh, some gap in monitoring data. And for all simulation and risk assessment, there are a series of uh, uncertainties uh, attached to them. And of course, we need to address these violations. Okay, so the big question as well is macroplastic, where do they all go? Uh, Basically, we really don't know where, uh, how the transport of microplastics is actually happening in a marine environment. Uh, the thing we know is over 80% of the plastic entering the marine environment is coming from land-based sources. And it would not surprise me that it would be the same uh, mechanism for microplastics. Okay, so some, uh, even some sources have been actually proposed, uh, such as city dust, so from basically the tire and uh, the wet and tires from, uh, from car tires. Uh, wastewater treatment processes as well are not fit for purpose in order to remain to retain actually these very small particles and as a result they can be actually present in wastewater, wastewater discharges which can find their way to rivers and subsequently to estuaries and the marine environment okay so monitoring of microplastic where and why so Monitoring is essential in order to understand the sources, pathways, and fate of microplastics to the marine environment. As mentioned before, very little is known about the fluxes of microplastics in different environmental compartments, uh, mainly rivers to estuaries to the marine environment, but also from the water column, surface of the water, to sediments and in biota. So we need to understand the environmental distribution of these particles. We need to understand also the impacts of plastics and macroplastics. If we don't know the numbers, how are we supposed to do some risk assessment on them? And we need to understand the economic impact of plastic pollution. And what about behavior change? Uh, as we need actually to understand and to estimate the numbers of macroplastics in environment to make sure that we have a public awareness and promote the societal and behavior change. Okay, so basically it's like the, what we're trying to do is to uh, use monitoring for the production of baseline data for the abundance and properties of microplastics for the identification of hotspots of contaminations. Long-term monitoring is essential to investigate any short to long-term impacts of best practices and new regulations. And I took the example of the UK with CFAS having 25 years worth of plastic trawled from the bottom of the sea to investigate little trends in the waters surrounding the UK. And we did observe a reduction of plastic bags found on the seabed following a reduction in use in plastic bags due to the plastic bag levy. And this is the best example of how monitoring actually can actually provide scientific evidence for any policy or best practices implementation. And our ultimate goal would be actually to be able in time to be able to monitor for microplastics for sediment samples, biota, and also for surface and water color. 
gives us a question as well is one can one method uh, fix all? So at the moment, um, as it is, there's not one single uh, magic solution to for the analysis of microplastics in environmental compartments. Uh, different organizations or research institutes are actually using a range of different methods, uh, making actually the comparison of data set quite difficult. Uh, as just as a preview, uh, I'm proposing actually uh, just a review of the different methods uh, mainly used uh, at the moment. So you have actually some non-destructive techniques. So non-destructive means that your particle is not destroyed uh, during the analysis process. And a lot of people are actually using macro Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, or FTIR for short. Another method is the fluorescence tagging of polymers using NiRed. And this method actually is used to induce a fluorescence of the plastic particles in those environmental samples. And after that, you just have to count uh, the number of fluorescent particles. Other people are using macro Raman spectroscopy in the same way as macro FTIR. However, I design, uh, define this method as moderately destructive technique because you use a laser. And depending on the laser energy, you can actually induce a combustion of your plastic particles and then you lose your, you lose your sample. On the other end, you have some destructive techniques such as pyrolysis GCMS. Uh, this technique actually does destroy your plastic particles. It's very accurate and sensitive. It only gives you the mass of microplastics in a specific environmental sample. And in this case, it doesn't give you the polymer type. So you have to use a, a complementary technique in order to have a full polymer identification. Okay, so what we are doing this CFAS, we are actually using the fluorescence tagging method of polymers using NAGRED, which was a method developed in CFAS in collaboration with the University of East Anglia. And what we are trying to do basically is just to apply uh, this technique on two different environmental compartments, and we started with sediments. And we're trying actually to induce this fluorescence aspect of macroplastic in sediment for long-term monitoring strategies. Okay, as an example, the first step in this uh, protocol was to apply uh, this fluorescence technique method on some sediments uh, sampled all around the UK. And we were able to actually uh, identify different sites with different concentration of plastics. This allowed us the identification of some hotspots of contamination for macroplastics. And we can then define the likely sources of macroplastic for this specific area. And then you can also guide the policymakers, and they can then take action on the sources rather than to treat the effects. We can also produce long-term monitoring data. So we just have to analyze the same station for consecutive years. And in the same way, you can then uh, identify the effectiveness of your regulatory or best practices implemented to see any long-term changes. The next step was to apply the technique to biota. So we started actually with uh, three different kind of uh, marine organisms, the common mussel, the Atlantic mackerel, and a dam. And the ultimate objective would be to identify a sustainable bioindicator of microplastics for UK waters. And this actually, uh, as this method actually has been applied as well as part of the Commonwealth Litter Program method. Uh, program, sorry, and it, actually we've been uh, running that at the moment as well on a wide range of other uh, biota. Okay, so the next step is the question I would like to ask is should science guide policy or policy guide science? Of course, scientific evidence plays an important role in a policy making process. Well informed and effective policy does require robust and reliable scientific evidence. And for every scientific evidence we are producing, they are peer-reviewed and quality controlled, so we can trust these data sets. But the big question is how to take action when evidence is lacking. Okay, and I'm just proposing an example of some evidence gaps related to microplastic that should be addressed either through rigorous scientific research or from policy pressure. So the first one will be from the, for the degradation rates of larger debris and their contribution to the presence of microplastics in the freshwater and marine environment. At the moment, we don't know actually the uh, impact actually of the degradation of, of larger debris for the production of microplastics compared to primary microplastic sources. We need to understand the fluxes of microplastics between the environmental compartments mentioned before. So we need to understand the transfer and the dynamic of the transfer between sediments, water column, and biota. 
We know there are actually a lot of microplastic out there. However, and we can have an estimate for the different compartments, but a huge chunk is actually missing and we don't really know where it's all going. Okay, so we need to understand as well the long-term environmental safety of new biodegradable plastics compared to conventional plastics. Are biodegradable plastics the savior uh, for plastic litter? Uh, we know that for the biodegradable plastics to be actually uh, biodegradable, they need very specific environmental conditions, which are rarely met uh, in a marine environment. And we have to be careful when using this kind of materials. Uh, environmental and economic implication of reduction removal strategies. So I'm sure you all heard about the Ocean Cleanup uh, Program, which has costed about $20 million actually just to, uh, to, to make it run. And at the moment, it's really struggling uh, to actually meet its uh, objectives. And the question is, should half the funding be allocated to other uh, removing programs? And of course, we need to understand the extent of the issue of lost or discarded fishing gear in a marine environment and the degradation rate. We know there's a lot of discarded fishing gear, but however, we don't know actually their uh, contribution to the to microplastic, to the microplastic program. program. Okay, so should science guide policy or policy guide science? Of course, policymakers are directing funding priorities. So we need to work actually with policymakers to make sure that the funding is appropriately allocated. As an example, a substantial funding was actually allocated uh, to boost national, uh, European, and international research on marine data. And as an example, the UK government launched a 20 million research fund to tackle plastic pollution. However, following this call, there was a lot of critics uh, from different uh, organizations, especially um, uh, one of the critics I've heard is funding war on plastic pollution, taking funding from other areas. And one example actually was an example of climate, climate change research, with a lot of uh, climate change researchers uh, actually saying that we are taking uh, a big chunk of funding for plastic uh, leads uh, that should be allocated to climate change. However, I personally believe that Plastic litter and climate change are very uh, connected to each other, and we should be looking at the big picture. Okay, so uh, a little bit of relevant policy needs uh, for plastic pollution as well. Uh, for uh, basically for microplastics and plastic litter in general, we should be looking into uh, marine fisheries and environmental protection, waste and resources management. As we've seen before, uh, plastic uh, the marine plastic litter problem. It's the land source uh, issue. So we need to have an appropriate and efficient land waste management. Water quality environment and public water supply. So we know that there's a lot of plastic particles in drinking water and what are the long-term effects. Protecting and enhancing biodiversity. So we have to make sure that for sensitive areas, plastic litter does not actually uh, impact on population health and population numbers. Marine management. Chemical regulation. So, should macroplastics be regulated in the same way as harmful uh, chemicals and be following the same uh, classification? And finally, human health and safety, as we know that macroplastic is present in seafood and in drinking water. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention on this matter. Uh, now, basically, we are ready to take some, uh, some questions if you like to ask anything to Fiona or myself. And of course, uh, we can ask after that, basically discuss the topic that you picked out for us to discuss in more. So thank you very much for your attention. In the meantime, perhaps we could fire away with a question from the SST office, if you wouldn't mind. Um, so with regards to your presentation, Fiona, um, we just wanted to know if you guys as CLIP have implemented any kind of schemes to drive behavior change? Um, and also, you know, following these schemes, what sort of data would you be looking at or collecting to measure this behavior change? Um, yeah, so that's from our team. So that's a very good question. Um, one, of the, one of the sides of CLIP is, is a best practice side, essentially. So both, um, a sharing, a showing, and an identification or an implementation, depending on um, the particular area of what's been termed as, as best practice. Um, but that can have a wide range from a point of view of, say, um, introducing a very simple home composting type system in, within a community 
Um, it can also go to, to a level of doing it um, through workshops. So looking at um, your uh, the reusable nappies is a really good example of that. Um, we had quite a few reusable um, nappy workshops within um, Vanuatu and Solomon specifically, having a look at um, how they can be utilized in the different ones that are currently available, not just your so from your very, very simple straight cotton ones that um, you've been able to buy for centuries, not quite centuries, I mean for you know a very, very long time to your more complicated bamboo ones and your different use of that. Um, so that sort of workshop um, would also involve that the identifying of the utilization of weaving baskets, specifically this was um, Solomon Islands to make um, for your plastic bags and your um, takeaway containers thing, and things like that, a wide range use of um, that sharing of knowledge within of that, that sort of older traditional use of weaving specifically of your banana leaves to make that sort of um, container and the share, sharing of that across groupings. A very, very similar um, concept arose through um, some contests with was the sharing of waste products to, you know, the weaving of waste products to make um, items that are then reusable as a solid fixed one. So yes, we've had a, a range in answer to your question. Yes, we have both um, implemented and funded the implementation of a range of different practices involving with that. Um, uh, also um, within the, the Pacific, the, there was a, a an art workshop involving, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, fisheries waste, so that was specifically used nets um, and WAC who gave you the presentation, gave the presentation last week was involved with that, that work and through their subcontractors as well. And so implementing and measuring your effect is going to, and does change depending on the, the type of um, activity or best practice that I've just highlighted, because from what you can judge from the range, some of them are day events and others are much longer term projects. Um, and this is where your social economic surveys have a factor where you can utilize them to look at pre and post mindset. Um, we've only done your more short term ones, so looking at it just before the event or uh, best practices rolled out to your longer term um, at, at the end of that. And obviously that depends on the time length involved with that. Um, unfortunately, because of the timeframes of the project at this point, we haven't got the return visits to see the long term impact and that becomes really crucial. And that's where I think it's really important for both local partners, if, if it's involving, say, the, so like with us, the UK working in other countries involves the more local partners involved in that long term change to monitor or governments involved in that long term change, just as they're involved with long term change from policy. Um, on the, the same question on best practices and that, um, we've made use of, of education packs and, and that as well, um, both from a community and school level. So that was a really long-winded, sorry, I apologize for that way of answering yes, and that the way of monitoring it is through social economic surveys, if that helps. Yes, thank you so much. It does help a lot. Um, and it was a wonderful, long, Explanation. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I don't see any questions, further questions coming in through the audience. Um, so perhaps you could just move straight on to discussing topic one. Um, again, that topic is what data is needed in South Africa to support change regarding marine litter and what changes are needed. So with this particular, because it's a topic discussion, um, what I'm hoping to do is that anyone in the audience, if you have any thoughts or anything to add, just add it in the chat, uh, chat column. Um, Stephanie, if you see anything coming into the chat column, just, you know, interrupt me and, you know, say this has come in as a question or comment at this point. Um, because very much I, we, we want these to be discussion topics, but let me start it off. So yeah, what data is needed in South Africa to support change regarding marine litter and what changes are needed? Now, South Africa is actually a really, really interesting country when it comes to um, both change when it comes to litter, and I'm going to say litter in this case rather than marine, and I'll explain in a minute why, and from a point of view of the data that is already available um, within South Africa and then also with where the gaps are. So 
obviously one of the reasons I said South Africa is really interesting from a, a little point of view is South Africa was actually the first country to implement um, a levy on South Af uh, on plastic bags, shopping bags. Um, and that was that was implemented rather than to deal with marine litter. I mean, all, all South Africans, or I'm not sure if you're all South Africans, sorry, that's, that's a huge assumption. But as many of you probably know as being aware of it is that was more to deal with it as a litter issue and it'd be called, referred to as the national flower and things like that. So South Africa's got a really nice long-term data set on whether or not that's worked. And as in most parts of the world, and I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this, the first bit of it obviously showed a really good success in that use of the levy. And um, as any other country in the world that's implemented that first you know, couple of years afterwards, you see a huge reduction in, in the use of plastic bags specifically being bought. And then that sort of flat, in South Africa, because there's that long-term data set, you can see it in Namibia had the same thing, sort of plateaued and started to increase again. So that sort of long-term data monitoring is really interesting. Um, and then the next step is to basically carry on that monitoring, which I know South Africa has done. So from that point of view, they've already introduced some really nice monitoring on it, but it's very, very patchy. So you have it specifically, you know, for, for the plastic bags and it's allowing for that review of the policy and that is that, that is really in place. But what, what is the other issues in place? Now, we know, if I jump down to the next one, within South Africa, that um, service delivery and waste management specifically is an issue. Now, this is just a, a background picture. What it shows is you've got a really nice picture of the currents in the background, um, showing very fast moving currents of South Africa. It removes a lot of the, the litter from it being that visible. And then this is the census data. So from the last census um, in South Africa, Africa, which was in 2016, and basically showing where your households have no rubbish collection or don't have service collection, showing it for overall South Africa. And then I just focused in on specifically for KwaZulu Natal, for Eastern Cape, and the Western Cape, as you know, and I didn't really do the Northern Cape because the Northern Cape's got a much smaller population. So on the three areas that have high population and are directly connected to the coast specifically. Um, showing that variation in whether households have some form of municipal rubbish collection within it. So South Africa has that data. They know which households have um, access to uh, municipal waste collection and all of that. So that data is really, really nicely already there. But when you start having the gaps, and um, I'm very aware that Linda Godfrey is on, online here and is really much an expert in, in um, this whole slide. So Linda, feel free to, to add in any comments if you if you wish to. But basically, a lot of South Africa, what's not known is where you start looking for your waste classification data. So individual studies have been done and they're not publicly shared. They're not well shared, except for the one that was done um, in for within Florida, within Kauteng. Um, but other than that, a lot of that data is not shared across so identifying for on a national government level and identifying on an individual campaign or industrial level, what is going into your household waste specifically, which shouldn't be, that should be, you know, being recycled. And if you're in your urban centers, your informal recyclers are doing just that and, and saving the country absolutely millions um, by returning those. Um, and that's been nicely categorized as how much the, the informal um, uh, sector actually contributes from that point of view. But still from understanding overall within your houses and specifically once you're getting into your rural areas and your rural areas that are not collected, connected to your waste management schemes or your urban areas that are collected to are not also not connected to your waste management um, and your service delivery and what those households litter and waste is essentially made up of. And then seeing where very simple solutions can add in that support, seeing the value of that, because the moment you can value, you can put a, a monetary term to it, you can obviously bring in your solutions that have economic benefits. Um, you can bring in your different different concepts are so basically saying, okay, we know in this area there's a lot of metal cans, they're worth this particular value, right? So with a pilot project of this size, we could initially make that work, sharing those results on successful ones learned and, and making it bigger. And a lot of that is lost where you have these small initiatives that have either worked really well because one individual is driving them or a few individuals are driving them or fail because of a very simple reason that could be solved. A lot of that is not captured and not shared. 
And that leads to very big data gaps and repeating of exactly the same issues over and over again, which then becomes an issue. Um, one thing that the, the Durban floods highlighted really, really nicely was, I think, the magnitude of the issue of how much of South African litter is entering the environment and is lost from waste management side. Because if you looked at the photos of the cleanups or if you were part of the cleanups, it was very, very visible exactly what the magnitude is. And that, that's one of the reasons I've got the, the currents on this particular image is because a lot of that is lost. So it's that the size of the problem that is coming from South Africa itself. I mean, we have it in the data from, okay, so many houses don't get waste management in that. But it's that next step further um, of actually seeing what is being lost into the environment and how big that is. And then looking at implementing um, the solutions at that stage. So I don't know if anyone's got any comments that have come in at this point. Uh, um, because, so that's, that was my introductory section to it. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I mean, the, the nice thing also, I mean, the South African data sets is like, so strapping bands are a really good example of something that was identified as an issue of um, the, the coasts coming from the, the beach cleanups and that, and then leading to very simple solution, policy um, solutions and individual solutions that have led to a decrease in the strapping bands. You know, and that was a really simple, just awareness on one individual item coming up out of beach litter and beach cleans and a solution almost introduced um, in a way that could be solved almost instantly. So Ian asks if there is a central database that is collecting information on marine litter. Uh, within South Africa specifically or globally, Ian? Because if you if you mean globally, yes, it's the Ocean Conservancy one that I mentioned. South Africa contributes to it. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember who, which is the organisation that oversees that uh, within South Africa. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a, a block. And then your over your other data sets that so your citizen science data sets. What I'm saying is shared. Um, and then you have your more academic data sets, which are long term and are available through your peer review. Um, UCT has a very good data set, um, which is available through through peer review. You can see the results of, um, for example, um, I know that African Marine Waste Network has their own data sets. So there are data sets that are, the moment it's published, it becomes publicly available. And those that are done through citizen science are all publicly available, yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I hope that answers your question, Ian. Um, and then moving on to Carol. Mm -hmm. um, she says, thank you so much for your presentation. This is such an important topic and I have many questions, but I'll try to stick to two. <laughs> you mentioned the importance of introducing alternative to plastic materials. I believe one of the examples you mentioned was sea seaweed-based packaging. I would like to ask how diverting these goods to the packaging, sorry, to the packaging sector may affect local economies in terms of resource availability locally, cost of producing alternative to plastics, and environmental costs. And then her second question well, is: Well, can I start with answering the first one first? I think, if yeah, you don't mind, yeah, okay, because um, otherwise I might might not include parts of it. Okay, so um, starting with, I just want to highlight because I don't, not sure how clear I actually made it in the presentation, I don't think I've made it that clear, but as with any ecological problem, and marine litter is no different from climate change in this way, the key bit of tackling it first will be reduction, and not just looking for alternatives, but changing our entire way our lifestyles operate um, across the globe, um, in that we have a disposable lifestyle. So we need to, as a population, look at reduction of waste, so you're reusing you're not using it at all in the first place, if it's not necessary, all of those concepts. That is first key and foremost, it will help tackle climate change, it will have help tackle biodiversity loss, it will help tackle marine litter issues. So, but when you then start looking at, so that's your first one. But then if you start looking at your replacement items, so yes, your alternatives, that is very individually dependent on the country involved. Now, South Africa itself doesn't produce oil, but South Africa has a very long coastline. So straight away, 
a movement towards a seaweed-based wine is beneficial within South Africa because from a baseline of where your raw material comes from, South Africa could benefit. Um, the seaweed one, what I was specifically referring to, it was just an example specifically for the, the plastic bags was, I mean, not plastic bags, the plastic drinking pouches was, I was referring to those ones that are actually edible where you eat the whole container. So you essentially eat the, the, um, the seaweed as well. Uh, cost production, yeah, no, that is a very important point. The thing, because of the, the low cost of um, oil at the moment, and it has been for a very long time, and I mean, we can track that back to um, the, you know, the, the big oil companies trying to squeeze out some of the smaller ones um, originally, and then it's sort of kept the price low for quite a long time. Um, that low cost of oil at the moment is always going to be a driving factor in plastics being so cheap and oil-based or plutonium-based plastics being so cheap. Um, and that's where reduction comes in is more important than replacing because at this point, because your technology for any form of alternative that is not your paper or wood or something that's existed for a very long time, um, hemp, cotton, whatever you want to refer to, um, it's new technology. And so you're paying for the development costs and you're paying for the cost that is not a big industry, it's not set up. So yes, that if you start looking at alternatives, you are going to be looking at more expensive. And that's where government policies can come in, in providing, um, uh, providing either taxing the stuff coming in that is made specifically from petroleum, and then using that money to help fund the alternatives so that you don't have this huge price um, discrepancy between the two. And that's, that's another level on, on policy layers. And you've always got to be careful there because then you can always end up that either the, it gets taxed but nothing gets um, you know, supported or that the wrong things get supported. So that's where data becomes really, really key in making sure the correct information is there. Did I answer every one of Carol's questions or not? So there is just a second question from okay. Carol. If you wouldn't mind having a dash at that. So Carol asks if you've seen any interest from local industries or companies in investing in plastic alternatives. And if so, what systemic and industrial changes do you think are needed to foster this transition? I think it would be also very interesting to explore communities' response to this issue and potential alternatives. And she says, thank you again. Uh, yeah, I actually want to focus in straight away on your um, community response and alternatives. I mean, community response is always very important because if you don't have a suitable response from your community on the receiving end, be it on a global, local, or regional scale, you're not going to lead to the change that you desire, um, or is that that you've aimed for in the first place. And but the thing is, when it comes to in, if you start talking about smaller community responses, and and by smaller I mean more more isolated, so not linked in quite as much to the global scale, you'll find that on, on that level, a lot of the time they have really good alternatives that have been lost through industrialization and through global sharing and i think yep. I think it's like the best example would be actually microbead and cosmetics, and especially through the public pressure of binding, binding these kind of materials in cosmetic and facial scrubs. And basically, it's like who thought it would be a good idea to add actually some some plastic particles, you know, in shower gels and facial cleaners. And basically, it's like you beat the microbead movement uh, and introduce actually a lot of pressure on policymakers to actually implement a ban on microbead and cosmetic in the UK. And this forced actually the industrials to come back to more traditional or alternative materials and now you can find actually some for example it's like shells so pitch basically it's like shells or seeds actually replacing microplastics sugar. material and sugar as well uh, as natural uh, ingredients and we have no need actually to add these uh, actually anthropogenic particles in our uh, cosmetics and daily use really so and I'm actually really glad to bring mention the microplastics there because it's reminded me from a point of view of, of data and data gaps specifically. Um, so obviously a lot of quite a few countries in the world have gone to the, the stage of, of banning microplastics, UK being one of them. Australia took a very, very interesting slant where they say, right, industry, we're giving you six months to do it yourselves and let's see what happens. Um, and then you've got some of the countries sitting back and saying, well, is this really a problem for us? as in, are we releasing microplastics through microbeads into our environment? And there's two ways you can look at that. You either look at it, and this is one of the data gaps, um, I think within South Africa is identifying specifically your microbeads, 
can either do it through your sediment samples, biota samples, you can identify whether it's microbead specifically or another form of um, microplastic, and then you, or you can look at your, what is being sold within the country from a product point of view and identifying um, the quantity for that point of view. But then, then that gives you that it's being sold, it doesn't necessarily show it's entering the environment where if you're measuring it in sediments and biota, you're seeing without doubt it's entering the environment. Did that answer all of Carol's questions? Um, I think so. Uh, I guess if you want to touch more on, you know, the interest of local industries or companies investing in plastic. Oh, open. yes. Right. Okay. So this, is, this actually becomes very country specific, industry specific. Um, personal, I'm not, gonna, not quite personal, but from a professional point of view, smaller and medium sized companies at this point seem more open to investing in the alternatives and talking about your alternatives. And having said, I mean, but that's on a, on a public scale. So that's on an open public scale. But having said that, I know that certain big companies um, are actually behind the scenes investigating it themselves. So I know like Unilever, for, for example, last year started hiring people specifically to look at developing alternatives um, within in um, their packaging. Um, I'm not sure how far that went. I just know they were at that stage um, because the rest of it hasn't been very publicly discussed. So that very much, <clears throat> sorry, that very much depends on the the company involved and um, but on the whole so, so for example your your plastic industry is it's concerned about the awareness and not no it's not concerned about the awareness it is concerned about the problem the people I've spoken to and that we've spoken to within industry are aware of the issue they're trying to tackle the issue in in, in different ways how much as I say it depends on that particular industry and the individuals that you end up speaking to. Um, but yes, I think because industry is actually very receptive to public opinion, and that's what you've got to remember. And public opinion at this point is very strong on marine litter and on plastic specifically. And industry listens to that. So industry, as long as they can find a viable alternative that still makes money for them, because at the end of the day, that is what's important because they've got to keep their industry going and they've got to keep their workforce going and that. They are interested. But at the same time, because there's these data gaps, they're also very aware of those data gaps. And it's a lot of money for them to make those changes. So where policymakers are pushing for change, industry saying, let us get the data in place if you want us to make these changes. It's all pushing back and saying, well, there's that data gap, so you can't make that change because it might cause a bigger problem. So it depends, as I say, it depends on the industry, but there is a very interesting interaction with industry on this, just because they are aware of the issue and they are aware of the consumer market is demanding change. And that is very powerful. Okay, wonderful. And I, I totally agree. I think it's super important for you know us as consumers to drive the change from bottom up. Um, so Carol does say thank you very much and yes you did answer all her questions and she's very inspired. Um, then just to come back to Ian's question, uh, he just wants to know if you know there isn't a collated database, so one database of all marine litter in South Africa? Uh, at this point, as far as I'm aware, that's not the case. As I said, the citizen science stuff is very much collated. Um, I'm not aware of the, I mean, anyone who's there who can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not aware of the others being totally collated. Because what you've got to also remember, Ian, is there's so many different ways of taking measurements. There's so many, it depends what you're looking for. If you're looking at um, particularly identifying categories, your categories have to match each other and your methodology has got to match each other if you want to start doing that sort of comparison. Um, and that's always going to be an issue for putting one database together. But I can say um, within South Africa, I think your, your academics are very collaborative and very open to working together. Um, 
and certainly the I, I would say even if it's not directly in one place I'd certainly say they are interlinked to my understanding um, so Ian says uh, he's from Yacht Boaz and he says it's a very interesting presentation and it will help with their vision. Thank you very much, Ian.